Hello. How's everyone doing? Good? Yeah, good morning. So we're going to spend the morning unlearning. How does that sound? Yeah? You spent yesterday learning. Today, we're going to unlearn everything that you spent yesterday learning. <laughs> All right. So my talk today is called Unlearning the Challenge of Change. And to start off, I'm going to break your brains a little bit. How does that sound? All right. So here's the first problem. Take a look at this. All right. So in that top corner, um, there's a directional word, yeah? It says down. What should it say? Up, yeah. All right, so together, in a second, we're going to read across, and we're going to say the correct directional word for where they are positioned, yeah? Everybody ready? Okay, again, the first one should say what? Okay, here we go. On the count of three, one, two, three. Some of you had coffee, others had tea. Okay, very good. So our environment in which we live and work demands us to unlearn so that we can shift and make room for something new. So I am Jesse Sterenshoes. I have a very long last name with not a whole lot of vowels and too many consonants all smushed together. And many times people tell me I spelled my name incorrectly. However, it is just spelled incorrectly um, to begin with. Uh, I've had a very long unlearning journey myself. Uh, I've had lots of different jobs before I started my own company 11 years ago. I've done things like babysit when I was a teenager. Um, I worked in television at Sesame Street. Uh, I worked at Disney World in college. Uh, I was a teacher, I taught in elementary school, and, and then, like I said, I started my company 11 years ago. I work with companies worldwide, companies like Skype and Netflix, Mayo Clinic, Tyson Foods, Capital One, so all different industries, helping them communicate, collaborate, and effectively solve problems in innovation. So lots of unlearning has to happen to do the job that I do, and that's where this topic came from. In fact, my whole life has to do with unlearning, and yours probably does too. Last summer, I had the opportunity to speak at Agile Australia. It was fun, however, I didn't unlearn quickly enough. Here was one of the problems, very similar to where we are now. Uh, I was with a couple of friends from the States. We were getting in a car to go to a speaker party. We got in an Uber. My friend Sarah, because there were four of us, somebody had to sit up front, and she was the lucky one. So she goes to get into the cab and uh, opens the door and then screams, and the Uber driver screams, like, ah, ah! And uh, then he, I think the Uber driver thought that she was mugging him, and then she's like, ah! And then she slams the door back, because she was like gonna sit in his lap, and he thought he, he was getting held up. It was very confusing, and then she ran around the other side, and then she sat in the proper place, and we were just laughing hysterically. Clearly, we didn't unlearn fast enough. It was super embarrassing. And then we figured it out eventually. We luckily didn't get run over at all because they have these fabulous signs that say, look right for all of us morons that come to a country where we are looking in the wrong direction. So shift is clearly a way of life. Uh, so what is unlearning? What is it? So when we learn, we add new skills or knowledge to what we already know. But when we unlearn, we step outside of a mental model in order to choose a different one. We discard something that's already learned, false or outdated information from our memory, right? So it looks a little bit like, like this. Hmm, it worked before, not anymore. And there are three levels of unlearning that are happening in organizations on an individual, 
team, and organizational level. And there are two types of unlearning. One where no habits are formed at all, and one where there are habits formed. So for instance, if you're going to give me a book about rocket science, I might learn a little something, but I'd have no problem forgetting it, and I'd be fine learning something else. However, if you were to tell me to not put on my seatbelt, I would have a problem, because I've been doing that since I was little. I actually had parents who told me to put that on since I was a kid. Another example, I told you I was from Florida. So did Mike. So uh, like two years ago, we had a hurricane. Uh, hurricane Irma came. And this is something we're quite used to in Florida. We have hurricanes quite a bit. And we lost our power. So I, I knew we lost our power. I knew we had no power in the house. However, every time I went into a room, I would flip the switch. So it was like I had the knowledge that there was no power in the house. But every time I walked into the room, just out of habit, I would flip the switch. So when I finally stopped flipping the switch, we had already had our electricity back on. So again, just habitual learning, right? So I'm like, oh great, now, now I'm finally not doing it and I actually have electricity. So this is another example of things we just do without thinking. How many of you have heard of this idea or the concept, it's just like riding a bike? Have you heard of that before? Yeah. So I want to show you this video real quick about the backwards bicycle. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. You've heard people say it's just like riding a bike, meaning it's really easy and you can't forget how to do it, right? But I did something. I did something that damaged my mind. It happened on the streets of Amsterdam, and, and I got really scared, honestly. I, I can't ride a bike like you can anymore. Before I show you the video of what happened, I, I need to tell you the backstory. Like many six-year-olds with a MacGyver mullet, I learned how to ride a bike when I was really young. I had learned a life skill and I was really proud of it. Everything changed though when my friend Barney called me 25 years later. Where I work, the welders are geniuses and they like to play jokes on the engineers. He had a challenge for me. He had built a special bicycle and he wanted me to try to ride it. He had only changed one thing. When you turn the handlebar to the left, the wheel goes to the right. When you turn it to the right, the wheel goes to the left. I thought this would be easy, so I hopped on the bike, ready to demonstrate how quickly I could conquer this. And here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Destin Sandlin. First attempt riding the bicycle. All right. So, the faster I go, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I couldn't do it. You can see that I'm laughing, but I'm actually really frustrated. In this moment, I had a really deep revelation. My thinking was in a rut. This bike revealed a very deep truth to me. I had the knowledge of how to operate the bike, but I did not have the understanding. Therefore, knowledge is not understanding. Look, I know what you're probably thinking. Destin's probably just an uncoordinated engineer and can't do it, but that's not the case at all. The algorithm that's associated with riding a bike in your brain is just that complicated. Think about it. Downwards force on the pedals, leaning your whole body, pulling and pushing the handlebars, gyroscopic precession in the wheels. Every single force is part of this algorithm. And if you change any one part, it affects the entire control system. I do not make definitive statements that often, but I'm telling you right now, you cannot ride this bicycle. You might think you can, but you can't. I know this because I'm often asked to speak at universities and conferences and I take the bike with me. It's always the same. People think they're gonna try some trick or they're just gonna power through it. It doesn't work. Your brain cannot handle this. For instance, this guy. I offered him $200 just to ride this bike 10 feet across the stage. Everybody thought he could do it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you didn't understand. You didn't understand. So, this way. <laughs> All right, so uh, whatever you're in. Yeah. No, no, you have to keep your feet on. Dude, All right, here we go. Just keep it Like you gotta start rolling at least. And go. Oh God! All right, back up. Okay, keep your feet on the pedal. Go. Ah! <laughs> Go right off. <laughs> Just keep your feet on the pedals. Tails on. Yeah, come on. Alright, one more time, one more time. Okay. 
Once you have a rigid way of thinking in your head, sometimes you cannot change that, even if you want to. <laughs> so here's what I did. It was a personal challenge. I stayed out here in this driveway and I practiced about five minutes every day. My neighbors made fun of me. I had many wrecks, but after eight months, this happened. One day I couldn't ride the bike and the next day I could. It was like I could feel some kind of pathway in my brain that was now unlocked. It was really weird though. It's like there's this trail in my brain, but if I wasn't paying close enough attention to it, my brain would easily lose that neural path and jump back onto the old road it was more familiar with. So what happens at the end of this video is he ends up trying to teach his son how to learn how to use the backwards bicycle and he challenges his son to do it, and his son learns to ride it in a few weeks. So why do you think the adult learns it much slower than the child? What do you think? What do you think that is? Hmm? Yeah. So the, the son, right, hasn't been doing it for as long, right? So he hasn't formed those pathways in his brain, right? So a child's curiosity, too, the, a child is always asking why, 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 right? They're much more curious. They haven't formed those pathways in the same way as an adult, so they end up being able to change and unlearn much faster. While I was researching for this keynote, um, I came across uh, information about Einstein, and I thought it was really interesting. So what happened is... I was looking around the things that were profound about Einstein, and what I found was that the things that were most profound, that he's most famous for, were actually the things very early on in his career. So even though he had more and more knowledge as he went on through his lifetime, the things he's most well known for are actually the things in the very beginning of his career, which is kind of interesting. And this makes me believe that newbies actually have something very valuable to contribute. So a lot of times at work when we're with a team, we kind of let the newbies, we're like, ah, eh, blah, 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 whatever, but the newbies, you don't know much, you just got here, so you kind of stay quiet and listen to us experts. But really their perspective is actually super valuable. Something that they're bringing in because they don't know a lot about the environment is actually super helpful, and we should be listening to what they say at the table. <clears throat> when I used to teach improv classes back in Florida, we would have two types of students. We would have students who had never done improv before, and we would have students who had come from other improv troops. And these students were very different. We had the ones who had learned a lot of the improv games and had a lot of skill, and we had the ones who were just kind of raw and ready to learn. And at some point, the ones who had never done it before just went rocketing past the ones who had done it for a long time. Because when you're forming a new team together, you have a whole new language, a whole new culture that needs to be formed, just like any team you have at work. And so the ones who had done it before had to strip those other things away, and that takes longer. And the, other, the newbies didn't have to do that. And so they went far past those people who had done it before, and it started taking them longer. I like this quote. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, and in the expert's mind, there are few. I want us all to play a little game, so if you will... Find somebody close by, and we're going to play a game called Space Numbers. So you need a partner, all right? So sit, scoot close to somebody. Scoot close. It might be behind you, and I'm going to teach you how to play the game. <clears throat> Here's how it works. All right. So you're going to have person number one is going to be facing person number two. Person number one is going to be drawing numbers in space. One, two three, all the way to 10, okay? If you know how to write your numbers to 10, you're good, okay? Person B, or person number two, will be mirroring you. One, two, three, get it? Yeah, till 10. Then, as soon as you make it to 10, switch, so you get to torture your partner, okay? 
Um, so you both get a chance to lead and follow. Yeah, you're going to go all the way to 10. If you mess up, I would like you to high five your awesome mistake. Okay, this is a game, and we're not going to be mad at ourselves if we mess up. So you're like, woohoo, and then start over and try to get to 10. So from 1 to 10, switch and let each person have a chance. Space numbers. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> High five if you mess up. Don't pretend you're perfect. <laughs> All right. You can always play it at lunch if you love it so much. <laughs> All right. Alan and Mike are still playing. They want to achieve greatness. <laughs> they are great. <laughs> All right, so how was that? How many of you, um, how many of you got stuck on four? Yeah. Uh, how many of you got stuck on seven because you had fancy pants? One of your people were like, I like to put the fancy slash in my seven. <laughs> like, what? What is that? Like, why? Why? Why did you have to put that fancy thing in there? Or like, you're one. You're like, I, we already messed up and we only had one number. <laughs> like, can we, come on, be simple. Um, so what was hard about it? Why is it hard? It goes the wrong way, yeah. Why? People do their numbers yeah, people do their numbers different. Yeah, people do their numbers different. Yeah, so you had to unlearn. Yeah, so what do you have to do to accomplish it? What do you have to do to accomplish it, to do it right? Just follow the finger, Just follow the finger right? So you have to unlearn what you know and simply stay present, right? You have to just simply stay present. So what I say to you is if it is hard to write a four backwards, have some empathy, people, for when you're doing an organizational transformation. <laughs> okay? Uh, yeah. So this is your brain on unlearning. What happens when you're trying to unlearn? So when we learn, okay, we form neural pathways in a part of our brain called the basal ganglia. And I like to think of it as a big, green, grassy field, okay? So if I'm learning something and I need to get from point A to point B in my brain and it's a big, grassy field, and I go every day learning my four from the big, grassy field, point A to point B, right? What happens to the grass? It goes down, yeah? And then you're like, hey, I'm going to draw my four backwards. And I have to go this way, yeah, to point C. Does the grass grow back overnight? Absolutely not, yeah? So it takes a long time to unlearn. And so this grass is still packed down. Think of it like that. So it's hard. It's hard, but it's necessary. So the unlearning curve is long, but 
what got you here won't get you there. Okay? So we don't want to be these guys. You know, you got you to gotta look up so you don't become roadkill. Where I'm from, they might eat you, actually. They, it's disgusting. I don't know what... Some people in Florida eat this stuff. It's gross. I don't recommend it. Uh, so definitely look up if you're in Florida. Um, so what got you here won't get you there. Yeah? Let's get personal. A couple of years ago, I had a call from the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. They asked if we would come in and teach a class called, uh, or actually it wasn't, it wasn't called anything, it was to help children learn to get ready for the working world, but they were visually impaired. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure if this is possible. I thought everything about what we do with using applied improvisation and experiential methods needs vision. And I thought, I don't know if we can do this. And I was stuck. I thought, hmm, impossible. And what was really going on in my brain is I was fearful, right? I thought, we've never done this before, impossible, we can't do it, everything we do relies on vision. And I was afraid. I had never worked with an entire population of people who had limited visual ability. I hadn't worked with people who were blind before, and so I was just scared of the unknown, and I was worried to take that risk. What if I would offend somebody, do something wrong? Um, I was really, really scared. And uh, I talked to a couple of my mentors, and they said, you know, you should try. You should try it. See if you can think about what you do in a different way, and try to reframe it, and see if you can do it. So. I took the challenge, luckily, and I did do it, and I figured out a way for it to work, and it actually worked really well, and they ended up actually teaching me a lot as well, and it was super rewarding, and I'm so glad that I did it, and I didn't let that bias, I didn't let myself get stuck, and I unlearned what I was thinking, that there was no way that it would be possible. So I want us all <clears throat> to take a self-awareness selfie and examine our own beliefs. Do I need to think, behave, or do something in a new way? Is there previous learning that is preventing me from thinking, behaving, or doing things in new ways? Is what I'm trying to learn a threat or challenge to my identity or how I see myself or how I see the world? Would trying harder give me the results I'm looking for or might it create more entrenchment? I like this quote by Alan Cooper. There is no mind harder to change than the one that has been hugely rewarded for not changing. How about reading that again? There is no mind harder to change than the one that has been hugely rewarded for not changing. So think about that. Think about in your company. There are lots of people there who have been doing very well. And then you come in and say, oh, we want to we bring in this new way of working. We want to bring in Agile. Why would they want to if things have been working just fine before, and on top of that, it's part of their identity, and on top of that, they've been rewarded for the old way of working? No, they don't want to. Unlearning is all around us. Think about all the different things we come into contact with where unlearning is happening. Think about life five years ago and all the different... How was banking five years ago? How was travel five years ago? How did we watch TV? How did we learn five years ago? How did we work five years ago? We've had to unlearn a lot to get to where we are today. Anybody familiar with this sign? Yeah? How do we know what gender that is? What gender is that that the arrow is pointing to? Female. How do we know? She's got a dress. Yes. Correct. So, what if it was never a dress? So my friend, Tanya Katan, she was asked 
by her company, Axosoft, to do a campaign where she was supposed to go out into the world and find something that people are familiar with that they look at all the time and get them to see it differently. And so she's walking around trying to think of something. What would it be? And she picked the bathroom sign, and she started this great campaign called It Was Never a Dress, and it became pretty popular. Um, and so I challenge you to see that differently now. So let's, let's try some of our own signs. Let's do, do our own campaign. So is this a man throwing something in the trash or a juggler giving up on his lifelong dream? Mm. What do we think this is? Anybody got any ideas? What, what could this be? What do we think? Yes, a man overcome by studying geometry. What else could it be? Rectangular aliens eating people. What else could it be? A what? Torrid romance with a computer. What else? We'll stop there. We can't get over it. All right. Wonderful. What about this one? What is this? Three pieces of bacon. What else is it? Snakes. Snakes in a race. What else? A top, uh, a top photograph of a man with very little hair. Yes. What else could it be? Anything else? No. Okay, great. Wonderful. Maybe it's three pieces of licorice on a balance beam. Wonderful. So how do we have unlearning organizations? How do we make our organizations unlearning organizations? So an organization that cannot unlearn will never become a learning organization. You have to do this part first. Many times I walk into organizations, they're trying to do these transformations, and they wonder why people are paralyzed and they're not moving forward. It's because they're ignoring the step that people have to let go of something first before they move forward. And you have to remember that transformation is not a transactional opportunity, activity. It's ongoing and changes over time. So when somebody calls and asks me to make a culture change at a retreat, I'm like, ha, 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 you're kidding, right? Like, I can't go to your off-site and fix your entire culture for three hours, right? That doesn't work. Uh, it's not transactional. You, this works. It takes a long time to do what you're doing. This is by Dan North, who I believe you've had at this conference before. Great guy. And mental models eventually become company values. Another reason why it's hard to unlearn. Change is hard to make when employees are playing a mental game of tug of war. So over here, they're saying, this is how I do it. And over here, they're like, try something new. Difficult. And here's a list of companies who refuse to adapt. Remember these? These guys, Blockbuster, Kodak, Toys R Us, MySpace, there's many more who have made it into the rubbish. What are some examples of unlearning at work? What are some things that we do at work? We can unlearn the designs that we use the methodology, methodologies, right? The technology, the approaches to the processes, the ways that we communicate our values change, all of those things. We could unlearn our org chart so that we don't end up having this conversation. That would be bad. How can we make shift happen? Here's an acronym I made for you. How can I help my team make changes? With the S, surface the resistance. H, hear what they have to say. And by hear, 
I mean, really listen, not just bobblehead, but actually listen. Identify the value for them to change. What is in it for them, not for you? What do they care about? Find ways to break down barriers and train them with experiential methods like the space numbers. Get them to feel it in their whole brain, whole body. Surface the resistance, the have to versus the wanna, I call it, right? Not you have to do this because I told you it came from the CEO. You know, we have no choice or you can leave. Uh, it's want to. What's in it for them? Why would they want to do it? Explore why it's important for them. On learning is hard and empathy is required. Remember those fours. Remember that. Not easy. <clears throat> Think back to when you first started. That's a great way to have empathy. What was it like when you first started your job and everything, <clears throat> excuse me, everything was new, yeah? Everything was a bunch of acronyms and it was like a foreign language. You couldn't remember what any of these things were. You didn't know, maybe they had different meaning before. You're like, what is a CSM? I've never heard of that before. What's an OKR? What's TDD? Never heard of that before. Think back to when all those acronyms had no meaning to you at all. So remember that piece of paper that you got? Could you take that out? And you're going to need a pen. Hopefully you have one or somebody next to you does. And I want you to write on your sheet of paper something that you are wanting to or struggling with on learning. What is something that you are struggling with or want to unlearn? Unlearn. And here is how you make a paper airplane for those of you who don't make them every day. All right? So you are going to write down that thing that you would like to unlearn, something you need to unlearn. We talked about a lot of examples of things. This could be personal or at work that you need to unlearn. You're going to write it on your piece of paper. You're going to make a paper airplane. You're going to hold it as much as you want to go throw it at somebody. You're going to hold it in your hands, and then we'll get to throw it. All right? So write that thing down. All right? I've got a couple of pens up here if people don't have one. What do you need to unlearn? What do you need to unlearn? It could be a process, a problem, piece of technology. It could be something personal, at home, at work. I'll give you like another minute to try to make your phenomenal plane. Mine usually goes straight towards my feet, if that makes anybody feel better. I'm terrible at making planes. You don't have to do the one up here if you're, like, really good at it. Also, if you're watching from another room and you want to have an airplane fight, you go for it. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. Okay, you're going to have about 30 more seconds to make your plane phenomenal. <clears throat> then what we're going to do is, uh, in a few seconds, we'll stand up, and then we're going to... This side of the room will face that side of the room. That side of the room will face this side of the room. I'll count to three, and we'll just, like, launch them at each other. And then you'll pick up the one that, that hopefully didn't hit you in the eye, and then you'll read it, and then I'll have a couple of people read what landed in their face, and, um, and, and we'll carry on with unlearning, Okay. Um, everybody good? So if you'll quietly stand up, please, without throwing your plane yet. Don't throw your plane. I'm going to try to take a picture, maybe. We'll see how this works. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right. One, two, three.
All right, now read one that you got. If there's some in the middle, you can share. There's some, there's some that just landed in the middle. You could give them to people that don't have some. And then I want to call on a couple people to read theirs. They, yeah, they're perfect. So does anybody have one they don't mind reading? Yeah. Yeah? I have to unlearn how to make paper planes. <laughs> nice. Anybody else? Theirs was like, looked like it was upside down. Um, yeah? Yes. Okay, unlearn frustration at, at current processes. Yeah. Anybody else have one? Yes. Yeah, unlearn interrupting people up uh, before people finish speaking. That's a good one. Yeah. Okay, unlearn thinking that I have to uh, respond to email instantly. That's a good one. Yeah. Unlearn procrastination. Yeah, that's a good one too. Anybody else? Yeah. Just work our expectations. Work at. Working over hours. Yeah. Unlearn working over hours. Yeah. That's a good one too. Yeah. Fear of challenging others. Yes. Unlearn the fear of challenging others. Hmm. Nice. Great job, everybody. So uh, let's move on. Nice job with the airplanes. Hopefully nobody's injured. That would be bad. What are the rules for getting ahead? We need to change habits and disrupt our routines, change mindsets, and bring an outsider's perspective. When I was working at... Uh, a giant food organization. I was working in their innovation lab and we were trying to solve the problem of food waste. So we spent a couple of days talking about how food goes from farmer to consumer and what are all the ways where food gets wasted on that process. And we were trying to innovate around, think about brainstorm, problem solve, like what are all the different things we could do. And on my walk home to the hotel, I called my older daughter. She was 10 at the time. And I was talking to her, and she said, Mommy, what were you doing? I said, oh, we were trying to solve the problem of food waste. We were talking about, the, what's that? And I said, well, that's when, you know, you waste a lot of food, and it goes into the garbage, and people um, throw away a lot of food. And she said, well, what, what's the big deal? What do you mean you're trying to solve that problem? And I said, well, this company wants to waste less food. They're a food company. Well, I don't see why you spent all week doing that. And I said, well, wh what do you mean? She goes, well, just make it taste like chocolate. I'm like... Oh, okay. <laughs> She's like, I don't know, why did you spend all week if you can just tell them to make it taste like chocolate? I'm like, oh, okay, great. So, uh, so I went back to the food company. And I was like, so I, talk, I was talking to my daughter, and she said, we're wasting our time. Just make all your food taste like chocolate. And they're like, great. So uh, what they ended up doing is creating a program at their company to bring in uh, junior high children uh, around that age to come in during the summer to be involved in their innovation lab and help them solve problems to kind of bring in an outsider's perspective because it helps to have just somebody totally outside with a completely different point of view to think through different problems for them. This is kind of interesting. You also need to think about curiosity, experimentation, and play. You can do an activity called escape thinking, which is taking a problem or a space and taking away one attribute. So the example I like to do is think about how we could change the idea of a restaurant. So if you were to take uh, a framework, take a piece of paper, write down a restaurant, and on the left side of the paper you're going to write down all the attributes of a restaurant. A restaurant has food, a restaurant has a table, a restaurant has servers, a restaurant has menus. Okay, what are all those things? And you were to take away just one attribute from a restaurant, right? So we were going to decide our restaurant now no longer has tables, okay? Now, what would the world look like 
what, with a restaurant that had no tables, and you would start to explore that. So it's not about taking away every attribute. It's just about taking away one thing and looking at it, slowly looking at something and questioning something by just slightly shifting the perspective, right? What is the world like now just by escape thinking with that one thing gone? You could conduct on learning reviews. So when you do your feedback and your reviews, instead of saying, well, what was the thing you learned this week? What was the thing you learned over the past month? What was the thing you unlearned? What were the things you let go of in order to make room for something new? You could use improv. You could use these games like we did today. You could use that escape thinking. You could use the numbers the space numbers, so that they start to see what it feels like to do unlearning. And you want to do it in incremental steps. So as you can see, there are lots of different things that you want to do. You want to seek different perspectives, disrupt routines, start with why, actively listen, break the rules, curiously explore, and integrate change on every level of the business, right? From individual, team, and the organization. Yeah. If you liked those games, I have a book called Control Shift, 50 Games for 50 Blanking Days Like Today. It's got tons of different games. There's visual games, there's design thinking games, there's improv games, tons of different things you can use that you can do as an individual, a team, or as an organization. So what are you going to unlearn first? Remember, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. DFTU. Don't forget to unlearn. Thank you.